A girl is trying to escape as she runs through a cornfield and manages to get a lift in panic. Eventually, she ends up in a hospital for treatment of her backstab wound. Dr. Suzanne Mathis, the hospital psychiatrist, introduces herself to the young, unidentified girl. But the girl stays silent and doesn't share any information about her recent incident or herself. Once she's more stable, she's moved to a different hospital room for a blood draw. But as soon as she sees the needle, she immediately starts getting violent. Susan is there to comfort her, and with time, they develop a bond. In the meantime, the Mathis family is having trouble at their home. The family consists of Suzanne, her husband Peter, who's a real estate developer, and their three daughters. Helene Mathis is a high school senior. Jules, the middle daughter, recently joined the high school, whereas the youngest one, Danny, studies in primary school. Jules and Helen are fighting because Helen never helps Jules at high school, while Danny is worried about her musical review at school. And on the other hand, Peter is in trouble because of his friend, because his friend backed out to buy the house which was built by Peter for him. Back in the hospital, the hospital staff are intending to move the unidentified girl from the hospital. Suzanne talks to Rhoda, who's a senior staff at the hospital, to let her stay at the hospital or find foster care for the girl. Unfortunately, all the foster care is full at the moment. Suzanne again tries to talk to the girl, and after a while, she finally gets to know her name is May. Upon realizing that foster care homes are not available, Suzanne decides to keep her at her house until they find one. Initially, Suzanne's family is surprised to see May in their house, but they adjust for Suzanne. Respecting May's physical and psychological condition, she asks Jules to allow May to stay in her room. In the evening, May wants to do the prayers when the family sits down for dinner. Although the Mathis family doesn't usually pray, they allow May to do so. When May prays to the Morning Star, the ruler of demons, all of them are puzzled. Hearing this, Peter quickly changes the topic to avoid more conversation. In the meantime, a detective shows up at the hospital looking for the girl with wounds on her back to interview her for the case. After dinner, when Suzanne wishes goodnight to May, she says she's grateful for all that Suzanne is doing for her. After that, May looks at a pentagram carved into her back with a smirk on her face as she whispers to herself, you deserve it. The next morning, a crow smashes into the kitchen while the family is preparing their breakfast. Peter places it in a box to transport it to a sanctuary, but May claims the injured bird won't survive long. Later, Suzanne takes May to visit her co-worker, Jerry, so that she can assess May's educational status to enroll her in foster care. According to Jerry, May was homeschooled and did well on mathematics and reading exams. Jerry also informs that May assisted her brother with the bookkeeping on a farm, but she resisted giving him more information. Next, Peter visits an abandoned bird sanctuary where he sees a bunch of scary crows flying around. Seeing this, Peter decides to take the injured bird back with them instead of leaving it there. In the hospital, Detective Alex Lopez meets Suzanne so that he can interview May, but Suzanne refuses to permit him because she's afraid she'll lose her progress over May. In the school, Jules' classmate, Sebastian, is impressed with her suggestions for the school newspaper's picture essay. May also shows an interest in Jules' photography for her project. Therefore, Sebastian offers Jules to work on it together. Since Peter's not able to sell a property, he seeks a mortgage payment extension from the bank to avoid foreclosure. On the other hand, Suzanne learns that a foster family has a place for May. The following morning, Jules discovers a frightening corn husk doll beside her bed. Turns out it was May's gift to Jules for her photography project. Even though Jules is reluctant to include the corn husk doll in her project, Suzanne persuades her to do so. At the same time, Detective Lopez pursues the May Dodd case and travels to the location of May's initial discovery. The place is off rural Route 67. Over there, he discovers a bloodied knife and a bare footprint. He wanders around the surrounding cornfield and discovers a scarecrow mounted by the head of a dead pig with a weird sign. Later, when Suzanne and May visit the foster home, it's packed with joyful young foster children. There, May howls at two little boys in a hallway, scaring them away. A white Christian symbol on the wall of the foster home disturbs her. Consequently, when they leave, that symbol hangs upside down. Afterward, May confesses that she didn't want to go to the foster home because she only feels safe with Suzanne. Unable to deny her feelings, Suzanne asks for permission to let her keep May for some more time. We then see a flashback of the girl being chased by the search dog along with the sheriff. While on the rural route, Lopez meets Wilson, sheriff of Amon County, by the side of his car. Wilson is the same sheriff who appeared earlier in the hospital looking for the girl with the wound in her back. Lopez wants to meet and interview May's family, but Wilson volunteers to interview them for him. 
At home, Peter hears back from the bank that he has six more weeks of the grace period on his payments. When Jules gets to know about May's wound, she's horrified, but feeling bad, she's willing to be a friend to her. In a flashback, we see the young girl running up a tree as the sheriff says, You have to come down sometime, Suzanne. The same night, Peter finds out that the bird has died, so he digs up a grave for the bird in his yard. When he goes to retrieve the dead bird from the box, shockingly, he finds it empty. Once again in a flashback scene, we see May walking in a dark grove carrying a dead crow in her hands. She carves the same strange symbol that was on the scarecrow into the bark of a rotting tree trunk. She then places the crow inside of it and starts worshipping. Next, we see a court hearing taking place for May's case. Since May's parents don't show up, the judge grants Suzanne the right to keep May with her for 90 days. He also orders her to admit May into the school. She agrees to join the school and Suzanne admits her to the same school where Jules and Helen study. Since Jules and May are in the same class, they slowly start becoming friends with each other as time passes. In a flashback, we find May residing in a single room with a large number of other girls. All of them in the room call her the Chosen One. But May confesses to her mother that she does not want to be the Chosen One. Hearing her daughter's plea, she promises to help her. Next, Detective Lopez confirms that the blood on the knife discovered outside the cornfield matches the blood on May's nightgown. Also, the knife had the prints of both May and an unidentified person. Later that evening, Peter plans a dinner for Suzanne and himself. As they spend quality time at dinner, the children enjoy their movie night at home. Just then, May insists Jules let her braid her hair. This takes her to the flashback where May is being prepared for a ceremony. Her mother, who had earlier promised to save her from the ritual, gives her a crown made of crow feathers. She encourages May to do what they say, and soon the ritual takes place. This results in the inverted pentagram carving on her back. Coming back to the present, Suzanne searches online to learn more about Amon County and the pentagram. She also talks to the nurse at her hospital, who earlier claimed to know about Amon County. Then she travels to Amon County and drops a message for May's mother, Abigail, in the mailbox. But when she asks about the family's house, She's answered with anger and is sent away. Alternatively, Detective Lopez tries to meet May's parents, but they don't show up. Instead, a fancy lawyer comes to meet him on behalf of her parents. Meanwhile, May is seen using various objects from the Mathis' house to create what appears to be a sacrificial nest. Notably, Detective Lopez informs Suzanne that he thinks May's family is a member of a cult. Furthermore, Lopez also informs that he met a fancy lawyer instead of May's parents. Later that night, Suzanne receives the letter back to her, which she wrote to Abigail. Curious about all that's going on, Suzanne asks May about her mother, but she responds by saying that her mother is a betrayer as she didn't help her even though she promised. After this, May seems disturbed by all her memories coming back. Then she goes right into the kitchen, takes a knife, and cuts up the meat that Peter brought from hunting. A few days later, Suzanne wakes up paranoid from a scary dream. The entire day, she seems to be disturbed as she makes an error in her patient's prescription. The same day, Detective Lopez travels down to the warehouse, the same place from where Suzanne was sent away. He secretly monitors them and clicks some pictures of them. Just then, a van leaves the warehouse and he follows it. Ultimately, he reaches Amon Town, located deep in the woods. Meanwhile, Suzanne goes to see a professor who's familiar with Amon Town's past. The professor says that May is the only member of the cult who managed to escape according to her knowledge. She warns Suzanne about May's potential tendency for hidden triggers to return to her cult as a result of her upbringing. When Suzanne returns home, Peter tells her about the issues he's having at work and the stress he's dealing with as a result. On the other hand, May and Jules are busy with their project with Sebastian. Jules takes some pictures of May's surroundings, and she also clicks some eye-catching pictures of May. After that, Jules develops those pictures and packs them in an envelope to send them to Sebastian. She deliberately doesn't include the picture of May with her scar but May puts it into the envelope herself and gives it to Sebastian. Later that day, Suzanne asks May if she's aware of anyone who's ever left Amontown. In response, May informs her that a child named Enoch attempted to escape, but eventually he was killed. Next, Suzanne informs Lopez about Enoch and expresses her doubt that Enoch might be alive. On the other hand, Peter holds an open house with Cheryl, who has good networking with potential property buyers. For a change, the open house goes well. Meanwhile, when Suzanne learns that Jules published May's picture online for the school newspaper, she requests to remove it. Later, on Danny's birthday night, the karaoke area for the birthday celebration is funded by an unnamed donor. 
The following day, Detective Lopez finds out that the Dodd family controls all of the lands in Amon County with the assistance of their lawyer, William Untermeyer. The five farms in Amon County make the same shape of a pentagram, similar to the pentagram on May's bag. Furthermore, Lopez doubts that May must be the daughter of the commander of Amon Town. One rainy night, May suffers a breakdown and she's seen marching outside holding a white flower in her hand while continuously chanting, I can't break the chain. Jules notices this and manages to bring her inside. While all this happens, a man watches it from a white van in the street standing outside the house. In the next scene, we see a guy burying a small body in West Virginia during the fall of 1922. The man appears to talk with a bird that lands close to him before leaving. After that, the Book of Covenants, which represents the beginning of Amon Town, closes. The next morning, Jules shares with Suzanne how she discovered May outside in the rain. Peter, on the other hand, receives a call from Cheryl informing him that there's an offer for the Windermere property. Later that day, Suzanne finds May in the backyard with her sacrificial nest. When Suzanne asks what she's doing, May tells her that she's wishing to be with the Mathis family forever. When Suzanne inquires more about it, May explains the story of the origin of Amontown. She narrates to Suzanne how the Dodd family's ancestors suffered greatly and how Caleb, the Dodd family's ancestor, was instructed by a crow on how to use Lucifer to help his people flourish. The only person who didn't follow him was a woman by the name of Mary Dodd. Caleb says that Mary's the chosen one and made herself a willing sacrifice as the first link in the chain. May says that plagues are returning to Amon Town, and this time, she's selected to be the offering as another link in the chain. And most importantly, the chain shall not be broken. If she breaks the chain, the whole cult will suffer. Taking note of all the information she received, Suzanne shares all the details with Detective Lopez. In the next scene, Sebastian invites Jules to the bonfire party on Halloween Day. She accepts the invitation and due to this, Isaac and Jules fall apart. On Halloween Day, the children get ready to go to the party while Suzanne claims she needs to go to the hospital. Peter is also busy that day as he has a meeting with Cheryl. Since all of them are busy, no one is there to pick up and drop Danny at the party at her friend's house. However, they make some arrangements and she goes to the party. In the afternoon, Peter meets with Cheryl and gets to know that she's ready to buy Windermere but at a very low price. Meanwhile, Sebastian picks up Jules and May for the bonfire party. During the party, Jules is disappointed with May as she accepts Sebastian's offer to dance. This makes her want to return home, but unfortunately, no one is there to give her a ride. While in the hospital, Suzanne checks the hospital computer, which she's not authorized to do. And unfortunately, she's caught doing so as she just broke the rules of the hospital. At the party, Jules is reluctant to leave the party but is unable to. Just then, a strange person claiming to be an alumnus of the school approaches Jules to drop her off. Desperate to leave, she accepts the offer. But as they're on their way, she gets a little afraid when he doesn't follow the instructions and takes her to a different place. Meanwhile, Danny gets in trouble because no one drops her at home. She ends up having an asthma attack and falls unconscious at the door of her house. Fortunately, Helen comes back home moments later and takes Danny to the hospital. While all of this is happening in the Mathis family, Detective Lopez decides to visit the leader of the Dodd family. He reaches there and sees a weird ritual being performed. Since he's on his own, he decides to take some pictures of them and leaves. Later, we see the family is devastated as Peter sees Windermere burning. All hell breaks loose as Suzanne sees Danny admitted to the hospital and at the same time, Jules is in trouble because she's on a ride with some unknown stranger. She gets more worried when she realizes she cannot contact Jules as her phone is dead. Next, when the family returns home, Peter and Suzanne get into a discussion as they're both worried about Jules. Meanwhile, the unknown boy drives Jules to show a beautiful sky full of stars and a meteor shower. This experience makes her happy and it seems she even likes him. Moments later, when she returns home, Peter and Suzanne finally take a sigh of relief as the argument comes to an end. In the meantime, Detective Lopez finds a clue from his research to reach Enoch. Back in the hospital, Rhoda asks Suzanne to take a therapy session as a punishment for her violating the hospital rules. During the therapy session, she opens up with her therapist. She speaks about her childhood, her mother, and her stepfather. Suzanne says that her mother was in an abusive relationship and her stepfather was also violent with her. When the therapist asks her about the scar that she has on her hand, she says it's because of her stepfather. One evening, when Suzanne returned home a little late, her father handcuffed her to a heater while the heater was turned on. Despite her begging for help, no one came to her rescue. She adds that her mother later helped her, but only by applying a mere bandage. After this incident, she decided to leave along with her mother, but she was ready to do so. 
Therefore, since that day, she started living with Grandma Helen, her biological father's mother. Suzanne's counselor makes some deep observations and analyzes Suzanne's past patiently. The counselor then concludes that there's a part of her that has not been able to overcome her childhood incidents. That's the reason she's projecting it all onto May and going beyond the boundaries to help her. However, Suzanne is reluctant to accept the therapist's conclusions. Later that night, May saves Jules from meeting that unknown person again. It turns out he's none other than Noah, May's older brother. The reason he's doing all of this is to trap Jules, hoping to get back at May. In the next scene, Detective Lopez goes to meet James Dressler, the guy who can help him to reach Enoch. On the other hand, Peter suspects that somehow May has some connection with the fire at Windermere. When he confronts May about this, she behaves very weirdly, getting down on her knees and touching Peter's feet. Next, Jules apologizes to Isaac and they get back together once again. Peter and Suzanne also apologize to each other for whatever happened earlier. He then tells Suzanne that he doesn't want May to stay any longer with them as it's creating turbulence in the house. Suzanne agrees and promises to send May away once she finds a safe place for her. However, the conversation is not intimate because from the other side of the room, May hears it all. Next, we see May at her sacrificial nest in the backyard, where she expresses her wish to remain with the Mathis family. However, Suzanne arranges for May to attend a Vermont school for children with problematic backgrounds. That morning, Helen breaks up with her boyfriend, Teddy, and Peter accepts the job of overseeing an apartment building. When Suzanne meets with Detective Lopez, they determine that the priest, James Dressler, might be Enoch by connecting him to the Poppy Farm fire. After Helen's breakup, she gets back in touch with Jules and they get ready for the harvest dance. That evening, Teddy and Helen's ex arrive to accompany May to the dance while she's dressed in Suzanne's high school gown. Meanwhile, Peter is contacted and interrogated regarding the fire at his property. The same day, Suzanne and Detective Lopez visit James. Evidently, he verifies that he's Enoch and that he escaped from Town. The night of the fire, Enoch was mistaken for James, who perished, and he saw it as an opportunity to permanently leave Amontown. In the harvest dance, the entire school applauds and supports May when she discloses her scar. Enoch discloses that May was designated to be burned alive as a sacrifice in a ritual that will occur that evening, just like Mary before her. Meanwhile, May is the winner and she becomes the harvest queen. However, she's triggered by the bouquet of white roses she receives. As soon as she gets those flowers, she storms out of the school. When Suzanne tries to protect May by running to the school, another car runs her off the road. Detective Lopez assumes at the station that the fire on Peter's land was started using an animal-based accelerant, and the investigator confirms his assumption. Peter is allowed to go, but Detective Lopez and Peter both believe that May's people are responsible for the fire and have powerful connections. But all of a sudden, May has gone missing, so Suzanne sets out to find her. Meanwhile, on the other hand, May's father has already started the ritual. In the next scene, we see May is back in Amontown and is ready to be sacrificed. Meanwhile, the seniors order Detective Lopez to close the Amontown case. Intending to save May, Suzanne dares to enter the Amontown grounds while the sacrifice ritual is taking place. Over there, Suzanne is caught sneaking by Sheriff Wilkins and immediately they engage in a fight. But as soon as the fire breaks out in the church, she flees from there. The community is informed of the fire before May is offered as a sacrifice, and they stop the rite in order to rescue the church. On the other hand, Peter, Helen, Jules, and Danny spend the night at one of Peter's apartments because the Amontown cult members tagged their house with a warning sign on their door. Now, to protect May from dying, Suzanne scales the wooden platform, but Noah sets the platform on fire. May and Suzanne jump to safety, but Noah still intends to sacrifice May, so they must fight him. May strikes Noah on his head, and this gives them the chance to run away. May's mother takes her daughter's place as a sacrifice so that the chain won't be broken. At the same time, Detective Lopez arrives, and in the panic of the moment, he shoots Sheriff Wilkins. May and Suzanne are then safely rescued by Lopez. At last, Suzanne takes some time off of work to concentrate on herself and her family, and returns to therapy. Detective Lopez is promoted to the post of lieutenant. This enables him to get a search warrant for the properties in Amon County. However, Amon Town is empty and abandoned when they get there, as they only find Sheriff Wilkins' dog. The Mathis family is no longer together. May now resides with Suzanne at her home, while Helen, Danny, and Jules reside with Peter at his apartment. When Suzanne comes to the house to deliver dessert for Thanksgiving, she assures Peter that she isn't giving up on them. However, after having previously agreed that May would not be permitted near the girls, Peter is upset that Suzanne has brought May to the house. 
He claims that May was never the problem and suggests that Suzanne was the one who put her job and her responsibility ahead of her family. As Suzanne and May get ready to eat, Detective Lopez calls to inform her that Teddy's SUV, which had been reported stolen a few days ago, has been discovered abandoned in nearby woods of Amontown. On the night of the dance, May can also be seen on a surveillance film concealing a bunch of white roses behind the school, which helps her pretend that she's triggered by the white roses to return to Amontown. Detective Lopez informs Suzanne that he thinks May staged the entire sacrificial episode to trick Suzanne and make her think May needs to be saved. Suzanne is frightened to realize that she doesn't know May at all because May has gone through great pains to keep Suzanne close and has demonstrated that she'll stop at nothing to have Suzanne for herself. Soon after, May invites Suzanne to sit down and eat, stating, we deserve this. Suzanne looks at her and begins to see her in a new light, but May feels pleased with herself for getting precisely what she wanted. In the last scene, we see a larger shrine with a picture of Suzanne in the center and a picture of May covering it. The End